Rose and Dow. Hello, Phantom fans. My name is Sam Olmstead. His name is Justin Irwin. We are This Is The Dump and Chase Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, whether it's on Western Reserve Radio, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This week's show is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at Advanced Podiatry. For information about treatments and services offered, locations, and appointment information, check out advancedpodiatry.com. So, Justin, it's good to be back here with you. Uh, If I recall, you took a last-minute ice fishing trip over to Hudson. How did that work out for you? Uh, Yeah, uh yeah. Was told to find a ice shanty and ask for a flaming Zamboni and spent the whole day freezing. Yeah. So not as advertised, I guess you're. Yeah. 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 Just a bunch of guys actually fishing. All right. I, I don't know how this is possible, but for anybody who hasn't heard this story, but there's just so many reasons I want to bring it up. Uh, quite recently, the uh, mayor of Hudson, Ohio, while a uh, city council meeting was going on talking about um, how some of the uh, residents of that area wanted to be able to set up uh, small you know, shanties or literally a little pop up tent um, on one of the lakes up there to be able to do ice fishing. Um, While some of the council members brought up legitimate concerns about, you know, if the ice cracks, if somebody falls through first responders, you know, all legitimate things. And then uh, the mayor of Hudson jumps in like uh, Grandpa Simpson screaming about shanties and prostitution. And anytime he's ever heard of a shanty, they have brought prostitution (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> can't even say this with a straight face i can't <laughs> i was when, when you read this on the internet it, you're you're like is this the onion no it's not the onion it's, it's and it, it it gives me such hope for humanity because thanks to this whole situation the word prostitution has come into existence <laughs> and that's our whole reason for being here <laughs> it's it's just made me oh so happy uh <laughs> I yeah, I, thank you for making the Ohio uh, trend on the Internet. You always hear about Florida man and everything down there. We always just get like goofy old men who just say ridiculous stuff in this state. And it ma- it makes international news. It <laughs> Always a good lo- always a good look for the state of Ohio. So as far as some like any hockey news or anything like that. Now, granted, that does take place on ice. So that can be. I mean, you know, maybe if they're expecting all that prostitution traffic, I'm sorry, prostitution traffic on that frozen lake, they might have to bring a Zamboni out every couple of hours to clean it. So, I mean, I guess that'd be a segue into hockey news that I'm going to try here and fail at miserably. I'll tell you what, it's a bad time to be a hockey ref right now. (laughs) In happier news. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's many times we're not fans of referees. I don't as much as we as much as we joke about physical violence against them. It's exactly that a joke. Um, it's gone a little uh, further than that lately. Yeah, I was going to say it's from what we've seen on the Internet and in the USHL, especially this is getting ridiculous. I mean, we had yeah, and we talked about this last week. Uh, we're not going to relitigate it here, but uh, Arseny Sergeyev from Tri-City throws a puck at an official that turned out to be a six game ban, three for roughing, three for abuse of officials. And then you had uh, went viral uh, yesterday. We're recording on Monday. This so yesterday went viral. What was that? Paul Halloran, Halloran, Halloran. Uh, from, yeah. yeah, from the uh, USPHL South Shore Kings uh, punched a ref right in the face. Uh, he received a lifetime ban. So if he ever wants to uh, play the game of hockey again, he's probably either going to have to go to Russia or get drafted by the Montreal Canadiens or make Tri-Cities roster. Yep. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, And then you had there was a game early Monday afternoon that was played between Colorado and Boston. Uh, Nathan McKinnon hauled off and slashed a ref in the leg after a face off. I don't know how he didn't get called. I don't know what he said to the ref that made the ref think it was an accident. When you see the video wasn't even close to an accident. There there was full intent uh, in what he did. Um, no clue how we got out of that one. But yeah, it's they, they might need to start padding these refs up a little bit better. They've been getting roughed up lately. Yeah, I I and. Nathan McKinnon is not the type of player I I would expect to do that. He's not exactly a, a nice guy to play against. But uh, I mean, I've always respected him, so that's that's kind of sad. Okay, so as far as this episode, uh, we will be talking about the Phantom series split with Muskegon. Uh, the Phantoms have a road trip coming up this weekend, two games in Dubuque. 
we will also have post game comments from Brad Patterson after the game on Saturday night and our interview with Phantoms forward Evan Werner. Uh, now, one issue we're having right now in the past, uh, we would record these shows on Wednesday release on Friday. Well, since we switched to recording on Monday, releasing on Wednesday, uh, the Phantoms have the school day game, which by the time you're listening to this will have already been played. Uh, so we get to bring back something we haven't done in a long time. Uh, we're going to uh, do three takes here covering three different scenarios for how this game went, since we have to recap something that by the time of recording hasn't happened yet. But by the time you listen, it has. So this will be take one if the Phantoms win. I mean, it was an incredible game. You know, I, I mean, obviously, you're going to get the best from the U18s. Uh, the Phantoms just in this game were just a little bit better. Yeah, it, it comes down to structure, um, fundamentals and just giving 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. All right. And now take two if the Phantoms lose. I mean, who didn't see this coming? They've been scoring like 30 goals a game for like the past like month. I mean, who? Yeah, I mean, I you know, you might as well, you know, put us up against uh, an NHL team. But yeah, we, we could have played a little bit better, I think. But uh, in the end, it wouldn't matter. OK, and now take three. Uh, this will be if the Zamboni catches fire and the game is postponed. I mean, wow, I guess would be the only word for it. Yeah, you see it on YouTube and you're like, that's not real. Uh, and then when it happens right in front of you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I always thought a good flaming Zamboni was, you know, uh, something to, you know, look at, look forward to. But wow, I we're lucky it did just blow up in our face. All right. And scene. OK, I believe that covers all uh, eventualities for the school day game. So with that, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we'll take a look back at this past weekend with the visiting Muskegon Lumberjacks. You're listening to the Dump and Chase podcast right here on Western Reserve Radio. Advanced Podiatry has been making happy feet in the Mahoning Valley for 35 years. Our offices are located in Cortland, Champion, Austintown, Columbiana, and Howland. Our Howland office has relocated to 8601 East Market Street in Howland Corners. Advanced Podiatry offers sports medicine and treatment plans for all ages. You can also request an appointment online by visiting our website at advancedpodiatry.com. Advanced Podiatry, where surgery is always a last resort. And we're back. So the Phantoms had the Muskegon Lumberjacks finally come and visit the Cavelli Center this last weekend. And this weekend pretty much went how every other weekend with Muskegon has gone so far this season. Uh, you win some, you lose some. The Phantoms pick up the win on Friday uh, and then take the loss on Saturday. So we'll jump right into the game on Friday. And God, there's a lot of scoring here. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the recap for that one. And um, yeah, it was a lot to write. No purple yeah. tunnel now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wore out my keyboard. All right. So getting into this in the first period, Muskegon takes a one nothing lead one minute into the game. That was Joey Larson, his 21st of the season from Tresca and Guaven at the 1036 mark. Youngstown's Grant Porter, his third of the season from Justin Varner and Anderson Trella tie the game at one. And then at the 1813 mark, uh, Youngstown's Justin Varner, his eighth of the season from Shane Lachance and Tomas Machu, giving Youngstown a two to one lead. And yes, there's going to be a pattern with this developing as this <laughs> game goes on. And with 51 seconds left in the period, Muskegon's Quinn Huston, his 23rd of the season from Richard and Guaven, tying the game at two. And that's how they would go to the intermission. In the second period at the 118 mark, Youngstown's winner Wallace, his 10th of the season from Evan Werner, giving Youngstown a three to two lead. And then just a few minutes later at the 517 mark, Grant Porter, his fourth of the season and his second of the game from Nick Williams, giving Youngstown a four to two lead. So what, just a little over a minute later, Muskegon's Joey Larson, his 22nd of the season and his second of the game from Napier, uh, that cuts Youngstown's lead down to four to three. Then at the 1824 mark, Jack Williams, his 11th of the season from Ellis and Tresca, tying the game up at four. Then with 33 seconds left in the period, Winter Wallace on the power play, his 11th of the season and second of the game from Trey Taylor and Adam Ingram, giving Youngstown a five to four lead. Uh, that's how they would go to the intermission. Now, I do want to note uh, with that assist, Trey Taylor was able to up his point streak to seven games uh, that set the uh, Phantoms record for defensemen. Uh, he was in a tie with John Franco Cassaro and Ryan Loney 
at six games, but this gives him seven. He is now the Phantoms record holder. So congratulations there to Trey. So moving on to the third period, again at the 118 mark, some these early and late period goals in this game. Uh, Muskegon's Jake Richard, his 10th of the season from Huston to McBrayer, tying the game at five. Then at the 1847 mark, only a minute 13 left in the game. Youngstown's Kyle Bettens, his 12th of the season from Jaden Grant and Carter Rose, giving Youngstown a six to five lead. Muskegon would pull their goaltender, but at the 1907 mark, Shane Lachance would pick up an empty netter, his fifth of the season from Trey Taylor, uh, giving Youngstown a 7-5 lead, and that's how the game would end. Overall shots in the game, Youngstown 27, Muskegon 24. Youngstown on the power play was 1 for 3. Muskegon on the power play was 0 for 1. Kyle Chevette stopped 19 of 24 in the win. So on the season, his record improves to 13, 7, 3, and 2 with a 3.05 goals against average and a .901 save percentage. A lot of scoring in this game. Youngstown able to get up by a goal or two. Muskegon coming back to tie it. That was the theme of this this entire game. Uh, But Youngstown able to pull away in the end. Kind of lowered our our blood pressure a little bit because typically, especially this season, it's not a good thing when you get into a high scoring affair with Muskegon. No, no. And that was kind of something I had pointed out last week, and I was really glad to be wrong. (laughs) Okay, so moving into the Saturday game, starting out in the first period, Youngstown Shane Lachance at the 436 mark picks up his sixth of the season from Grant Porter and Justin Varner, giving Youngstown a one to nothing lead. Uh, This was notable that the previous six games these two teams have played, Muskegon had scored the first goal in every game. Uh, So Youngstown finally in the seventh game of this series was able to score first. Not that when it's all said and done, did him a lot of good. And then uh, Youngstown again at the 13-11 mark, Grant Porter, his fifth of the season from Shane Lachance. Uh, That gives Youngstown a two to nothing lead. And that's how we would go into the second period. So moving into the second period, uh, Muskegon, the only goal of the period at the 1301 mark, Quinn Huston, his 24th of the season from Richard and Guaven. Uh, that cuts Youngstown's lead to two to one. I've gotten away from doing the shot count every period, but it's notable in this one. Uh, shots in this period were 19-1 Muskegon. <laughs> <laughs> if, if Justin would have had hair in this period, it would be gone. <laughs> he would have torn it out by the time that second period was over. Ah, it wasn't just that. I mean, it carried over well into the third period. Yeah. So moving into the third period, this was all Muskegon. 44 seconds into the period, Ben Strinden, his 20th from Hudson and Richard, tying the game at two. At the 11.07 mark, Ben Strinden again, just repeating myself now, his 21st of the season, his second of the game, again from uh, Huston and Richard, giving Muskegon a 3-2 to two lead. And after the Phantoms pull their goalie, Muskegon's Philip Tresca at 19.09, his 23rd of the season from Mellenbacher and Williams. That gave Muskegon a 4-2 to two lead, and that's how the game would end. Uh, shots in this game, really no surprise, but uh, wow. Uh, Muskegon with 45, Youngstown with 18. Youngstown on the power play was 0 for 3. Muskegon on the power play was 0 for 5. Jacob Fowler stopped 41 of 44 shots in the loss. Uh, His record drops to 2 and 1 with a 2.12 goals against average and a .936 save percentage. Everything that worked so well for the Phantoms on Friday just seemed to completely fail them on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, they started good um, and just faded. Like I said, it took them till... Almost the eight minute mark, I think, in the third period before they got a shot. There was like almost a 27 or over 27 minute drought there. Um, You're not going to win a lot of games going 27 plus minutes without registering a shot on goal. So after the game on Saturday, we were able to talk to Coach Brad Patterson um, about the Phantoms defense in the second period. While the bulk of the play in the second uh, took place within 20 feet of Jacob Fowler, um, he only gave up the one goal. He at some points literally was standing on his head uh, defense, having to swarm around him to help protect him, uh, help protect the net. It was a sight to see. They were able to hold off. But again, in the end, uh, didn't work out that way. But no. uh, But yeah, we asked Brad Patterson about the defense in the second period. And this is what he had to say. Yeah, they did a really good job. I mean, I didn't feel last night they were in a lot of motion uh, on the perimeter. And and we addressed that after the game and talked about it. I felt like, you know, they were were getting to the paint quite a bit. And and that's um, obviously you do that anytime you kind of can't get one in or I don't want to say you're struggling but you're you're looking to generate and, and 
generate in the hard areas. Um, I thought they did a good job of that. I, I don't want to say it was so much on our, our D on box outs. It, to me, it's our puck management um, in areas that are pretty far away from the net. You know, you, you look on on the walls in our end uh, through neutral ice. You know, they do a good job of gapping, so there's not a lot of space in front, and the space is often behind with them. Um, so our puck management started poor in the second period, which led into you know being in our end a little bit more and guys are tired it but that's the tough area of the ice and I'm sure I'm pretty sure that I heard that uh, you know going off the ice like that's an area that they wanted to be better and they were so with that we're going to take another break on the other side we'll break down the weekend in this week's edition of four points keep it locked in right here on Western Reserve Radio Miss an episode of By All Means, and you could miss a lot. I have the sound up, and I appreciate the guys that do the work now. But it is uh, with great appreciation I see what the guys do, not only the announcers, but also the players. So we've had wonderful playoffs. I mean, single, double, triple overtime games. It's been fantastic. By All Means, Tuesdays at 5, right here on Western Reserve Radio and streaming live on westernreserveradio.com. And we're back, and it's time for Four Points. For listeners new and old, Four Points is where we break down the previous weekend into four categories. What we liked, what we didn't like, favorite moment, and the Dump and Chase podcast, three stars of the week. So this week, I'm going to kick it off with what we liked and what I liked. Overall, the entire weekend was the Shane Lachance, Grant Porter, Justin Varner line. Combined these three over the two games, uh, six goals, five assists. You, you usually talk about that top line with Jaden Grant, with Adam Ingram. Uh, this was the line to contend with this weekend. Uh, these guys were getting opportunities every time they were on the ice, you know, end up scoring uh, six of Youngstown's 11 goals on the weekend uh, between the three of them. Uh, so, yeah, as far as what I like this weekend, uh, those three guys right there. Yeah. Secondary scoring is always a plus. Like you said, um, it's usually the, the more of the top line. So. That was definitely, a, you know, a positive on the weekend. I like just on Friday, we were competitive. Um, I think we were kind of lacking that on Saturday. Friday, they came out, they scored first. You know, we responded. Anytime they mounted the comeback, um, we had the next goal. So uh, so going on to what uh, we didn't like, what I didn't like, uh, was actually the tying goal in the third period on Saturday. Youngstown was on their heels most of the second period, but, you know, a testament to their defense that they've been playing as of late. Other than giving up the one goal, they were able to hold Muskegon off. Uh, they were protecting Fowler. They came out for the third period and they were just flat footed. I mean, they weren't moving around. It was it's just I don't know if they just spent every last bit of energy they had in that second period. Um, they came out completely flat to start the third and, you know, very quickly, only 44 seconds into the period, you know, Muskegon ties the game at two. I kind of feel like if they could have had a little bit of energy and maybe not allowed that goal, we might be talking about a different in, uh, outcome because even though Muskegon did what they did, I felt like defensively Youngstown had some momentum going into that third period based on what they did in the second. And to build off that, I guess what I didn't like was that 27 plus minutes where we weren't getting any offense. I tend to think, you know, if we maybe had gotten one or two more shots on goal, maybe we could have built something going into the third. Or, you know, maybe if we could have got the first shot on goal in the third, come out, like you said, with some energy. But we, you know, didn't really start pushing back until almost midway through that third period. And uh, that really wears your defense out. Well, yeah, it, it, it's hard to get a shot on goal from 180 feet away. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, the, the, the accuracy suffers a little bit from that far away. Yeah, I, you got to do something to get the puck out and get down and, you know, hey, just put a slap shot on net or something. <laughs> Uh, so for my favorite moment of the weekend, uh, this was my favorite moment just because I wasn't paying attention as much as I as I should have. Um, I, I reached a point at the uh, in the third period on Friday where I was not paying much attention to the scoreboard. Um, and then when uh, Kyle Betton scored that goal with a minute 13 left, which ended up being the game winner, 
I was happy that he scored the goal until I looked up at the clock and realized there was only a minute 13 left and then realized I haven't looked at the clock in like 10 minutes. So <laughs> I had no, no, no idea how much time was left in the game. Uh, so he go, uh, he gets the goal, puts the Phantoms up six to five. I'm excited about that. And then I look up at the clock and I'm like, oh, there's only, you know, 73 seconds left in this game, which made me even more excited. <laughs> They're going to be lucky to pull the goalie. Uh, yeah. Again, all on the basis of I had not looked at the clock in a while, so I had no clue that that period could have ended and I would have had no clue why the buzzer was going off. Uh, there, <laughs> apparently, I just was caught in the moment or whatever. I was not looking up at the scoreboard. So, yeah, uh, because of all that, Kyle Bettens gets my uh, favorite moment of the week. Uh, I think my favorite moment of the week, um, watching Jacob Fowler stand on his head in the second period, but especially um, there was a diving club save. I mean, that was one of the, the nicest saves I've seen in a while. Kind of just a desperate push off, throw the glove out and hope it, uh, the puck lands in it. But yeah, it just, you know, watching him perform miracles there in the second period to keep us in it. Uh, it's too bad we didn't, you know, get him something in the points category, but uh, that's how it goes. You're going to take your first loss at some point. I'm going to have to put you on the spot here. Uh, the, your video of him making that save may have to work its way into the uh, intro video for the show on YouTube. Yeah, that's that's one of the ones I'm putting uh, into the, the highlights uh, folder just for that. So with that, we've now come to the Dump and Chase podcast, three stars of the week. And starting out with the third star, that will be Phantoms defenseman Trey Taylor. Uh, two assists on the weekend, both on Friday. W but like I said earlier with that, uh, he now holds the record for Phantoms defenseman for a scoring point streak at seven games. Uh, unfortunately, the streak was snapped on Saturday, but that just seems to be how these things work. But uh, yeah, so for that, uh, Trey gets third star of the week. Yeah, his consistency has been, you know, one of the brighter spots on the uh, season. So... Um, second star of the week, Shane Lachance, two goals and assists. Um, the one goal, the one that he wrapped around, uh, the goalie kind of snuck it in the post. That was another one I might stick in the highlight category for <laughs> later intro videos. So with that, the only thing left is the first star of the week and of no shocker here. That goes to Grant Porter, three goals, one assist on the weekend. This, but this boy was playing like somebody lit his butt on fire. You know, he he picked this weekend to shine and boy, did he ever. Yeah, whatever cannon they shot him out of, they packed a little extra powder in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so congratulations to Grant Porter, first star of the week. And that will do it for four points. So after the game on Saturday, we got to talk with Phantoms forward Evan Werner. Now, Evan came to the Phantoms in a trade with the Lincoln Stars. And by coincidence, Evan's billet in Lincoln was none other than Gene Cotter, who is one of the hosts of Thunderstruck, the unofficial Lincoln Stars podcast, who we've had on the show before. So without further ado, here was our conversation with Evan. All right, and we're back in the locker room area here of the Cavelli Center. We're here with Phantoms forward Evan Werner. Um, now, you're from the Dallas, Texas area. I mean, other than the Dallas Stars, most people throughout the rest of the country don't think of Texas as kind of a thriving hockey hotbed. Do you see it another way? or um, Growing up, uh... You know, I th went through different organizations, uh, but recently it's been uh, it's been a lot of great talent come out of there. Uh, a lot of older kids, uh, some play in the WHL, um, some are in college now. So it's a you know it's growing, but um, it's certainly not up there with Michigan yet in those markets. But yeah. um, it's certainly getting better for sure. Now, how did you get started playing hockey? Um, so my mom's side of the family they they're from Toronto. So my grandfather played, my uncle played. Uh, my mom was a figure skater, so that was kind of the first thing uh, to get Evan on the ice when he was younger so um, I probably started skating when I was um, four, around four years old I hated it at first and then I uh, you know went on the ice one day and couldn't get off so that's kind of how it started okay no I mean you had fairly good success at Little Caesars uh, last season you were on the Nall All rookie team this season starts out it was kind of rough sledding um, and even up to the point, you know, Coach Brad had even used the phrase snake bitten for you. Um, and then that second game in Rochester, you finally get your first goal. You end up scoring goals in six of your next eight games. Just what what has the difference been for you from that point to now as opposed to the beginning of the season? Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I felt like I was playing good hockey. I just couldn't get one to go in. Um, so, you know, when we went to Rochester, you know, I kept going, kept grinding. Uh, I finally got that one. It was kind of, you know, 
monkey off my back. So just kind of keep playing my game, and you know, I started to happen more. So probably uh, recently, last few weeks at least, I um, mean, you've seen success playing on a line with Winter and Charlie. Um, what is it about the three of you together that's worked so well these past few weeks? Um, you know, we get along great. Like, uh, you know, we hang out. We have good chemistry in the locker room. We joke with each other. Uh, you know, if we make a mistake on the ice, you know, we're hard on each other. But, um, you know, we you know we feed off each other and, you know, try to get better every shift. So, yeah, I'm just, you know, the connection off the ice also helps. Now, you're committed to Colorado College. Uh, what about that program appealed to you in uh, committing to them? Um, so I went out on a visit and, uh, you know, the new staff uh, there was great. Uh, you know, the new arena they got, uh, I just kind of felt like it was the place for me. You know, I wanted to be a part of something that uh, was growing and, you know, can be a very good program in the future. So that was kind of the, the, uh, the process in my recruiting. So. What are your goals for yourself for the rest of the season, especially since we're just inching closer and closer to the playoffs now? Um, you know, definitely keep getting better, working on the things in practice, um, you know, continuing to contribute, you know. Um, but most importantly, just playing as a team, uh, you know, working hard and ultimately, you know, try to get that goal to get to the finals. So. All right, and for the last question, um, it's actually a fan question. It's from this guy named Gene in Lincoln. Um, he basically said there's a bit of a story behind you making your USHL debut. Are there parts of it of that story that you would be able to tell us? Um, there's some interesting parts. So I was in Lincoln uh, a couple years ago for about a week and a half, two weeks. I went up there. Didn't know if I was going to play, but um, you know, just practiced with the team, and I stayed with the Cotters. And uh, they played Friday night, and they ended up. I think they won Friday night or lost, but. Uh, there was some things like that shouldn't have been done, and I ended up being able to get to the lineup the next night. So <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty funny, but you know I was glad I was able to get in there and get a game. So well, I had to get the question. I'm pretty sure yeah. Gene will be listening to this. But um, Evan, yeah, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Good luck the rest of the way. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, so before we go to break, I wanted to mention our assistants for the weekend who helped us out after the games. That would be Gavin and Brennan. I don't know about you, Justin, but I really enjoyed the concept of having an assistant. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Um, unpaid labor. Yes. And they're related to me, so it's, you know, legal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but our thanks to Evan for taking a few minutes to chat with us. So after this break, we'll look ahead to the future and a two game road trip to Dubuque. This is the Dump and Chase podcast brought to you by Advanced Podiatry right here on Western Reserve Radio. Hello, Phantom fans. This is the Dump and Chase podcast. We're trying to model ourselves after what you guys have done a little bit. Voice of the Phantoms and friend of the show, Mr. Matt Lipsack. I, I am along for the ride and perhaps provide some modicum of adult supervision here. Although, really, that's a lost cause at this point. We welcome back Phantoms president Andrew Goldman. That went smoother. Uh, it yeah. went smoother than it did with Matt. I want that <laughs> added. To the, I want that added. <laughs> what are you shaking your head now for? I'm agreeing with you because oh. he has absolutely killed us this year. Yeah, that's that's not helping. I'm trying to process. Okay. Well, so far finger guns has meant Sam shut up. So <laughs> <laughs> got to come up with a different sign for that. Listen, that like was frightening. And we're back. So this coming weekend, the Phantoms will be taking another trip out to Dubuque. Dubuque's had a pretty good run here lately, although they kind of fell off. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so this uh, this year, this will be the fifth and sixth meeting between the Fighting Saints and the Phantoms. Uh, there'll be one more after this. Uh, the Phantoms in the three games played so far are have two losses and an overtime loss versus Dubuque. Uh, the last meeting was uh, th uh, three games they have played so far, December 10th through the 12th. Those were all in Dubuque. That was, of course, the uh, Disney on Ice weekend uh, that were supposed to be played at the Cabelli Center. <laughs> we're not bitter. We're not bitter at all. Yeah, the first game, uh, the Phantoms lost five to four in a shootout, lost the second game five to three, lost the third grade, lost the third game four to one. So adding the, those all up uh, for the series this season, Dubuque has outscored Youngstown 14 to eight. Youngstown on the power play in this series, one for 16. Dubuque on their power play in this series, three for seven. Dubuque played three games last weekend. Uh, on Thursday night, they got a win against Mad Madison, six to two. Uh, this game actually put them in first place in the Eastern Conference, jumping over Chicago and Muskegon. And Dubuque celebrated this feat by losing their next two on Friday and Saturday. 
uh, losing to the under 18s, nine to nothing, and then losing to Madison four to two. So, uh, you know, that's a heck of a way to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're going to lose some sometime. There's no stat category for getting trashed by 17 year olds. <laughs> However, if there was, uh, they would have added one to that. You know, we're going to have to kind of face that ourselves at some point. So I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to throw any stones here. So Dubuque will come into this weekend with a record of 24, 12, 2 and 3. That works out to 53 points and third place in the Eastern Conference. Youngstown coming in with a record of 18, 14, 4 and 3. That comes to 43 points and fifth in the Eastern Conference. Still right there in the mix with Madison with games in hand, a little bit ahead of Green Bay with games in hand. So just kind of treading water there in fifth. Dubuque on the season has scored 168 goals for an average of 4.1 goals per game. They've given up 137 goals for an average of 3.3 a game. That is a plus 31 goal differential. Youngstown on the season has scored 126 goals. That's a 3.2 per game average. They've given up 125, which is also a 3.2 per game average right now with a plus one goal differential Um, with the special teams. Dubuque on the power play, 25.6 percent. They are second in the east. Their penalty kill at 83.2 percent. That is first place in the Eastern Conference. Youngstown on the power play, 20.9 percent. That is sixth in the conference and on the penalty kill, 76.6 percent. That is fifth in the East. We are doing a lot better. Dubuque, however, is, I think, the one team we haven't proven that we can compete against. Uh, This is going to be a big weekend, I think, to test the the medal of this team. We've shown we can uh, run with pretty much any other team in the East except Dubuque, so... So another thing to mention that hopefully fingers crossed might be a little bit of an advantage for the Phantoms. Uh, Dubuque will be at Waterloo on Friday. Uh, The games uh, with Youngstown are on Saturday and Sunday. They uh, travel to Waterloo on Friday. Then we'll come back uh, for a game on Saturday night with the Phantoms and then early afternoon on Sunday. So quick turnaround there after traveling, even though it's not that long of a trip, but uh, fingers crossed, maybe at least on uh, Sunday, that might work out to an advantage for uh, the Phantoms. Uh, But yeah, the game on Saturday, February 26th, that is an 8.05 Eastern start time. Uh, The game on Sunday, February 27th, that game starts at 4.05 Eastern. Both of these games will be available on Hockey TV. And like you said, this is going to be a test for the Phantoms. Uh, These teams haven't played in over two months, um, but it's safe to say this is a much different Phantoms team than what Dubuque saw the last time. Yeah, we we've made uh, significant improvements defensively. We are as sound as anybody. That's going to be big. Um, Lately, I think we've been playing a little bit more disciplined. You know, hopefully we will manage our time on the ice, not take too many penalties. You know, I think Dubuque special teams record speaks for itself on that. So I, you know, stay out of the box and then hopefully, yeah, like you said, Hopefully that game in Waterloo takes its toll on them and uh, big weekend for the Phantoms. Yeah. So as far as Friday night, go Blackhawks. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, <laughs> hopefully this one goes to a shootout. Yes. Ten rounds. <laughs> <laughs> and we're down to our final break. When we come back, we'll wrap up this episode and look ahead to next week's show. You're listening to the Dump and Chase podcast right here on Western Reserve Radio. And we're back. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week. We will be back next week to recap this weekend and look ahead to a couple games at the Cavelli Center with the visiting Madison Capitals. Also, you will hear our interview with Phantoms forward Adam Ingram. As always, we want to thank the official sponsor of the Dump and Chase podcast, Advanced Podiatry. For office and appointment information, check out advancedpodiatry.com. So as always, the Dump and Chase podcast is brought to you by HockeyFan.com. And be sure to check out our syndication partners at OhioHockeyDigest.com. You can hear this show every Wednesday on Western Reserve Radio, either on WesternReserveRadio.com, through the TuneIn or Live 365 apps, the Western Reserve Facebook and Twitter pages, and the Youngstown Phantoms Facebook page. 
This show, both new and archived episodes, can also be found on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite audio podcasts. Now, all of these can be found on our Linktree page, the link to which can be found in the description of however you are listening to this episode. You'll also find links to our social media accounts there as well. You can find Justin on Facebook at facebook.com backslash YT Hockey Fan and on Twitter at YT Hockey Fan, both of those P-H-A-N. And you can find me on Twitter at dump underscore chase pod. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in this week. As always, likes, subscribes, reviews, and comments are always appreciated. So for Justin Irwin, I'm Sam Olmstead. We'll talk with you all again next week right here on the Dump and Chase podcast. Bye now. Bye.